Greetings. This is I Am Vermont 2, and my name is Sha'an Moliere. I Am Vermont 2 is modeled after the I2M Harvard Initiative. The I Am Vermont 2 photo story project shines a light on the diversity of identities and experiences of black and indigenous people of color all across the state of Vermont. The I Am Vermont 2 project is a medium for BIPOC to tell our stories and convey how racism has a significant impact in our lives. This is the first known statewide multi-generation project done only by black and indigenous people of color living, working, and attending school in the state. Social justice activist Grace Lee Boggs said, creativity is the key to human liberation. A poem. A new moon is coming by Alana Hart. The moon is always full. We just can't always see it. So we name it, name it by what we can see, half, crescent, it shows itself in fractions and slivers. Depending on the light, it might look like part, but it is whole. When you're feeling almost nearly partial, when they treat you like you're half empty, disappearing from view like a waning crescent. When no one sees you because the light around you doesn't, no, doesn't shine quite right, and not even the sun knows your angles. When they have Saturn V and NASA, while others have Icarus wings, and they wonder why only they launch. When even the solar system seems systematically unjust, when it feels like you're in eternal orbit, a satellite heavy with eclipsed hope. When they call you fractured and fractions, half, quarter, and crescent, declare you two thirds of the moon. When you've been through countless phases, but none of them had enough stars. When they are astronaut using you as a place for unloading and floating, pierce you with a flagpole, stab into your skin, proclaiming you theirs. It's only natural you'll howl at lunacy, but remember, you are whole all the time, like the moon is full, even when we can't see it all, or when no one bothers to look up. You are the reminder that day is gone, and day is coming back. Remember that even your hair forgets, forgets gravity floating to apogee, and your craters are just places to pour more love. You are phases and stages of celebration and grief. You are rare as blue moon. When you don't see the sun, just know you have your own light, natural, needed. Even when it seems like lunar and solar are only polar, remember that they both sleep in the same sky. Just remember, the moon is always full. Thank you. Today, my guest is Dr. Alana Hart. It is an honor and privilege to welcome you to the program, and I thank you for being here. I first met Alana working on a project for UVM. So before you tell our viewers about yourself, can you share what it was like to be asked to be on the program? Oh, um, I feel like just knowing that there's a place where people are talking about microaggressions and drawing attention to the experiences that BIPOC people have, lots of places, but especially in Vermont, um, felt really like a special opportunity. And I'm just honored to know that, that it's being addressed at all, since it does seem to be one of the lesser seriously taken um, form of racism when you think about it when you think about structural racism and cultural racism and interpersonal, sometimes interpersonal is those moments where people just say, you're being too sensitive. Um, so I'm glad to know that it's being taken seriously somewhere. And again, I'm so delighted to have the opportunity to have you as a guest. So you wanna share a little bit about yourself, who you are, how you identify, what you want our viewers to know. Sure. Uh, I am Black. I am from New York City, from Queens. Um, I've lived in Vermont for about two and a half years. Uh, my family is from the Caribbean, um, Jamaica, Barbados, Montserrat. And, uh, and I never thought, I lived in the South for many years, and I never thought that I would move north of New York. I thought <laughs> New York was the final stop. 
Um, and I've been an educator for 16 years. I'm a, the Dean of Students at a private school um, in town. And um, as you heard from my poem, I'm a writer. Yes, you are. And that's when a couple of our connections of not only being from New York, but being from Queens. So it's, you can take right. the gal out of Queens, but sometimes Queens <laughs> sticks there. Um, what was the reason for moving to Vermont? Uh, my husband got a job in the area, so we decided to relocate and have, have stayed, even though he's remote now, we've decided to stay anyway, for now at least. So we know that you're a writer. What are your other passions and interests? What do you do for joy? Um, well, one passion that I think is not quite for joy, <laughs> but one passion is doing a lot of equity work. I work with the Vermont Partnership um, for Fairness and Diversity with Curtis Reed, um, doing equity consulting for various clients. And it's really important to me, and I can't say that it brings joy because it's there's a lot of frustration involved, um, but it does. Feel, it is really important to me, and I do equity work in my own setting as well. Um, but I think for joy, it's definitely hanging out with my kiddo, who's four. Um, and, you know, yesterday he, he lost his first two teeth in one day. <laughs> so just keeping up with all those stages and, and phases has been really fun for me. So what has it been like for your family since they moved to Vermont? Um, it's, it's definitely, sometimes we feel like we're still adjusting. We were, um, we, I moved here as a stay-at-home mom, so that felt like an adjustment from working. And then we are from a very diverse place, and now we're essentially in like a monolithic place. Um, and then COVID hit pretty early on. So more of the time, COVID has been here for longer, for more than half of the time we've been here, more than not. Um, so that's a big adjustment. So part of moving here was like, well, we're still going to be able to go all these places, and I can still take my son back to Queens all the time. And COVID really changed that for us. So it's really impacted our, our experience because part of that experience was just the ability to leave the area pretty frequently and easily. I think you are, I've interviewed uh, guests uh, during COVID, but I believe you're the first one as far as living in Vermont that a lot of their Vermont experience has been um, affected by COVID. You had mentioned that um, your uh, parents had come from the Caribbeans, and you and I had shared that, you know, as my grandparents had. And some of the uh, different approaches to living um, as a first or second generation immigrant and um, coming from the Caribbeans and whether living in New York and then moving into Vermont. Uh, I know for me, uh, there are just so many levels of unpacking, uh, whether it was colonialism, whether it is uh, aspiring to the great American dream. And uh, so I, in talking to other folks who have similar backgrounds, uh, what is your take on that? Yeah, I think that it, it sort of, I don't know sometimes if it makes the adjustment harder or easier because on one hand you are sort of used to that um, bifurcation, I guess, of being of two places. Um, and one of those places a lot of the times is super rural compared to the city that you live in. Um, but other times it just feels like it's a whole new layer of a place to get used to. So. For example, when I lived in the South, people assumed that you're exposed to tons of racism because the South is notorious for being the most racist place. And I came here and I told people, no, Vermont is definitely the Mississippi of the North. Um, I have a friend who calls it Vermont Tucky, but it's definitely, um, when you just think of the various places and the various parts of yourself, it's definitely the hardest, been the hardest one for me. And not because the South is not racist, but because it's so much more diverse you at least can operate in affinity in a way you can't hear. We're here when you're subjected to racism in that way. Um, and so frequently it just, it others you and it is more isolating, it is more lonely um, and that feels pretty immediate, you know, but um, so it, it doesn't really feel, doesn't really feel comparative to having 
that like Caribbean background where it's like inherently multicultural and you have people from like all the East Asian descent and um, it feels very distinctly different and, um, and isolating than that. I know when uh, moved up to Vermont and they started talking about diversity and multiculturalism and I thought my family is that between you know my father's in the south and my mother's from the Caribbean and that wasn't the approach that was taken which leads to you know what has the impact of racism uh, for you uh, living in Vermont what has that been? Yeah, I mean, I never thought that um, I, brought, I came to equity work because of my love for research, my love for qualitative research and sort of studying people um, and being part of like moving something forward. And most of the time it was through like action research for literacy because I was an English teacher for years or um, in my doctoral studies or like character education and, and behavior programs. But now applying so much of that to equity work feels pretty essential. Um, and it often feels like, uh, in terms of the relationship part of it. So that's, that's the professional element where I feel like it has to be part of my responsibility to move this forward because it would just be wrong not to. Um, but socially, I feel like there are so many like nice racist people who are still friendly enough, um, that I often feel almost like I have to offer some information because they struggle here with colorblindness, which threw me off and sent me spiraling back to the early nineties. I was like, people are still saying that people are still saying they don't see color. So in social interactions, I often um, feel like I need to know, there's like a different layer of questioning where I need to know more about your opinions and your politics and who you are just to feel like I can have a regular conversation with you um, than I think I would have in any other circumstance because you just never know who you're dealing with in this area. <laughs> Absolutely. This summer, I read Robin D'Angelo's De uh, Nice Racism and how mm -hmm. a liberal white, uh, liberal white folks perpetuate racial harm. And it was a relief in a, in a sense of validating the reality and the experience is that I've come into. And uh, mm -hmm. I agree with you around uh, trying to uh, navigate a comfortable space for you to be able to exchange ideas. And in many times you're having to lay the foundation, being able to teach people in that manner. So as we're talking about microaggressions, um, can you describe a microaggression um, that you have had and how it made you feel? I think I think we all have a plethora. <laughs> I think we have the, the, there's always the hair touching, there's always the um, unsolicited opinions about what, because I usually wear my hair in like a big curly fro, whether they prefer that without my ever having asked. Um, there's always the assumption that you represent a people as if we're all the same and the onus of, of educating people becomes on you. But I think the hardest is when you feel it impact your kids. And that's definitely been worst for me. Um, I had a very, I perceive as well-intentioned white woman who was, um, around my, my child for a while and she was talking about him. And he also, he's a big kid, he's black, he's hes like, you maybe you see him, you probably might think he's a couple years older than he is. Maybe he just, you know, for whatever reason I got the impression, she just assumed he would be rough and tough and he's very sweet and gentle and he cries easily and he's just a really nice kiddo. But she was talking about him and she kept saying, and he's not aggressive at all. And he's just, he's really not aggressive at all. And she said it maybe five times in a very short period of time and she hadn't repeated anything else. And I, I took away from that conversation that she seemed surprised that in seeing him prior to interacting with him, there was some element of shock involved that she was still like, it was beyond belief that he could just not be aggressive. And I, I because of the work I do and because of who I am and because no one else will ever say it, I had to, I had to address it and, and ask her and I said, did you, did you notice how many times you said that in it? And I had to take a beat first. It wasn't immediate. Sometimes you have to circle back. But I said, I, I really, 
um, felt concerned by how many times you indicated that he's not aggressive. And while I recognize that he isn't, um, not too often you hear someone carry on about what a child isn't. And then saying it that often, just it was just a, a, just a concern. And, you know, maybe you can explain it. And she, it was a mirror for her, right? And that's what's, that's what's hard for a lot of people in general about themselves, but certainly for a lot of white people, a lot of nice white people. It really disturbs their sense of self and their, their perception of their friends and neighbors who they like to think, oh, racism is this far away clan rally attending thing but like no racism is right here and it only disappears when you acknowledge it because it's it's not racism yes or no it's racism on a spectrum of how much and um and i think that moment for her felt like a maybe it's a how much um and the more often we can kind of push the needle to say no nope, it's not not at all the bias is there it's unconscious you can bring it bring it to life and find out how much of it and where as opposed to no, 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 I'm not. Because that white resistance feels like a microaggression in itself, you know. Yes, and in reflecting, what is it, what does she think about black males? That they're violent is what has came to me exactly when you were talking, that of keep saying how gentle someone is, you're surprised by what? What is that exactly challenging for you? What is your perception of a gentle black person? How curtailed um, was is your information? So as a mom, back to, you know, the feeling in the moment and what you needed, you know? So you talked a little bit about, um, you know, bringing stuff back to her, but if you were to think of specifically at that time, what is it that you needed? Not what you wanted to provide for her, but what did you specifically need? I needed a space that I felt was really safe for my son where he wasn't the only black boy somewhere where people couldn't inherently make those assumptions and that he had more of a chance to just be himself and not be othered in that way. And the sadness for me is uh, 35 years later uh, where I first experienced the unsafeness, uh, the stressors that um, my child had received in school, and not only um, based on um, who he was, but it got spilled over to me and how I parented. Mm. I was asked recently about uh, when did I first notice racism? And I asked the person who asked me, when did they notice? And one of the things that I think that um, had not thought about, even in growing up in New York City, you think about, you know what neighborhoods, you know to some degree how services are rendered out. But we thought that we were getting an excellent education. And so in fourth grade, when I was told that the, there were no slaves in New York City, that they either immigrated from uh, the then West mm. Indies or mm. migrated from the South, was the first time I heard myself in the story. Well, we now know that was a lie. <laughs> we now know not only was, were there slaves, but New York City was the second largest slave market harbor in the US. So the degree of how racism permeated everything uh, and beginning to untangle that, and they say, oh, that's monumental. That's life generational work. 
What barriers do you think you may have put up because of uh, racial microaggressions? Hmm. I think going back to what um, I mentioned before about how it impacted me professionally and then personally, that personal element really did serve as a barrier because there are quite a few people I consider either colleagues or acquaintances or from you know other stay-at-home moms from when that's that was what I was doing. Um, but I I couldn't feel like we were friends until I knew, until it had been revealed that they were anti-racist or that I knew their perception. So um, I think that that has served as a barrier, um, but it's a protective one that I plan on keeping for as long as I'm here, but I, I acknowledge that it is one for sure. Yes, Vermont is um, putting in a lot of effort to make it welcoming and attracted to BIPOC. And the theme I hear with BIPOC is it's not safe. It's not a safe place for them to thrive. It's not a safe place for their, uh, to raise their children. And so if you were to think of you know, what could a community do, one where your life, your humanity is visible and where your experiences are validated and your contributions to the community are valued? Yeah, this is actually something I've thought about a lot recently. Um, Al Wakefield and two of his colleagues have been traveling to different towns in Vermont, encouraging people to adopt the Declaration of Inclusion. And I've Partnered with, them a bit, partnered with them a bit in terms of how to actually operationalize this and how to create action steps from a promise and where does the promise begin and what do you do next? Um, I've, and as much as we think about what the town should do and what, what the select board can facilitate, all of which are important, um, I think one of the greater things that happens first is people committing to doing personal work don't put the onus on people of color to teach you something like looking things up and interrogating your own decisions. Why did I think that? Who are the people around me? How did that become such a big deal? How did I end up with a circle that is that is not diverse at all or whatever it may be? Um, people really interrogating their own thoughts, abandoning the concept of colorblindness since we know it's not real, even if you say it is. <laughs> um, and really committing to learning feels like a big thing. In terms of something that can be facilitated wider than that and can be visible to others, um, then I would go back to some of those big steps the Declaration of Inclusion has, has brought around. And that is really towns partnering with those organizations because we are here. We're not always visible because we're not always together. We're not operating in affinity. Sometimes we can't find each other, but we are here. So if you're in a town um, partner, with the organization where the BIPOC people are, where the LGBTQIA people are, where the differently abled people are, and gather those people and find out what's going on with them, what their experiences have been, and um, and listen to the voices and always, always start off with empathy and listening, but always move to actionable steps because one without the other won't matter. Absolutely, and I, so agree about the diversity of BIPOC. I find that, and I'll just say specifically how, just as a black person, that, we, that there's this idea we're monolithic, and my family was not monolithic. The North, the South, and the uh, Caribbeans weren't all singing Kumbaya together. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and that many of us did not have that space, although some of us did. And it depended whether it was at your church, because I grew up in a predominantly white uh, neighborhood. But I went to church in Harlem. Uh, developed friendships there, went to a high school that was predominantly black and Puerto Rican at the time. So that culture outside of my family um, was accessible. And I think about, especially um, BIPOC who grew up in Vermont, uh, that mm -hmm. the physical 
contact maybe not be as accessible. They have all kinds of digital ways of, of connecting that we <laughs> never did. But um, there's something to be said to walk into a space and you're uh, embraced by the aromas coming out of the kitchen. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, before we end, um, are there any last words or thoughts or even feelings mm -hmm. that you might want to uh, convey? Um, well, I think the last thing, if I had to think of anything, and I know this has been said a lot, but it can be said one more time, um, that diversity is not the same as inclusion. It's like a starting point. And having us there and having us feel welcome and having us truly belong and feel like we belong um, are a lot more than just the invitation. So we want to know that you're happy that we're there and that you appreciate what we're bringing to any place. And that's a big deal. Breathe that in. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you again, Alana, for being my guest, for sharing your experience and for that heart-touched poem. I think that getting out of our everyday narratives and moving into poetry sometimes taps the emotions. Uh, and uh, thank you for being a part of that. And thank you, viewers, thank you, for Sean. watching. I am Vermont, too. Like us on Facebook. Thank you.